Hello, and welcome to episode 28 of the My Care Champion cast. This month's show is going to be a plug-in episode from our friends at Rural Health Rising, a podcast hosted by JJ Hodshire and Rachel Lott of Hillsdale Hospital. In just a moment, you'll hear them speaking with MHA CEO Brian Peters about the state of healthcare in Michigan, everything from where hospitals stand in terms of their financial viability, what action is being done by lawmakers to support our hospitals, and how we can continue to address rising costs, staffing shortages, behavioral health care challenges, and much more. With that, we hope you enjoy our April episode, and thank you again for being a listener of the My Care Champion Cast. The healthcare industry today is facing a number of challenges, and state hospital associations are advocating for and supporting hospitals through it all. So, how do state associations support and engage rural hospitals in these unprecedented times? With issue prioritization, active advocacy, and direct engagement. I'm Rachel Lott. And I'm J.J. Hodshire. And this is Rural Health Rising. Welcome to Episode 101 of Rural Health Rising. I'm J.J. Hodshire, President and Chief Executive Officer of Hillsdale Hospital. And I'm Rachel Lott, Chief Communications Officer. Rachel, our guest today is a return guest, a good friend yes. of Hillsdale Hospital, a good friend of Michigan hospitals and health centers, critical access hospitals, uh, someone who is a fierce advocate uh, for us yes. in Lansing and in Washington. Uh, and we are so excited for the second time, right? Mm -hmm. To have, I think it's the second time. Yes, our special guest, Brian Peters, president of Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Welcome back to Rural Health Rising. Well, J.J., Rachel, it's always a pleasure to be with you, especially when we're here at the beautiful Hillsdale Hospital. And thank you for having me back. It's Absolutely. a real pleasure. It's great to have you. Well, to start, Brian, for anyone who maybe did not hear the last episode that you were on, which it's been a while, it's mm -hmm. been several months, I think, um, why don't you give our listeners just a quick reintroduction of who you are, your background, and your work at MHA? Well, absolutely. I've been uh, very fortunate to uh, work at the Michigan Health and Hospital Association now for 33 years. I began there as an intern oh. and uh, have served now uh, for eight years as the CEO and president. And uh, we have the, the great privilege of working with amazing healthcare leaders, including a JJ and other rural hospital CEOs throughout the state of Michigan, uh, and also our large uh, urban health centers and, yeah. and academic uh, medical centers, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a, a membership that is incredibly diverse mm -hmm. and incredibly widespread, but the magic of the association uh, over the years has been our ability to bring everyone together and create alignment on public policy and political matters so that we can really uh, achieve our mission, which is, quite uh, frankly, mm -hmm. to advance the health of individuals and communities. It's that simple. Uh, it's a mission that I'm very proud of and mm -hmm. that we've been able to uh, accomplish year after year. And we're going to talk about that a little bit further into this podcast mm -hmm. because you've been instrumental in some significant legislation. Uh, and you and I have worked on several of those pieces, one of those being the CRNA legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and then advocacy for, and, and, and we're going to talk about how you have to be somewhat careful in your role because there are, at times, some competing interests, right, among mm -hmm. hospitals, uh, sure. some that want a certificate of need, some that don't like the certificate of need process. And then we balance that with your advocacy. And we're, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I, I want to really highlight some of the focus areas that you have been instrumental in as the leader. But before we do that, um, we start every podcast with a question, and it's called The Why. Um, so I want to know, our listeners, you know, this is a national podcast, someone listening in Iowa right now mm -hmm. doesn't know who Brian Peters is. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't, I'm telling you, you're missing something great. You are. <laughs> but uh, this gives them an opportunity to know a little bit more about you. So what is your why? What motivates you? What gets you up out of bed in the morning to do the very significant work that you do to save hospitals in Michigan? What is the why? Well, it's a great question, and I think uh, you start with why. If you're not passionate about what you're doing every single day, uh, you're in the wrong career. Uh, that's really my view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was somewhat uh, uh, by uh, uh, by f uh, good fortune, quite honestly, that I came into this role at the MHA. I actually ran a sport fishing charter uh, company for about five years uh, in northern Michigan, and one of my a good clients was the predecessor, my predecessor, Spence Johnson, the CEO hmm. of the Hospital Association for many years. And uh, long story short, he offered me an internship at the association, wow. which I, I said yes after, after thinking about it for yeah. a bit. It was not my intended career path. But after um, 
working for about a year as an intern, uh, it exposed me to all of the uh, the great things that Michigan hospitals and, and other healthcare providers are doing every single day, and I became very passionate about uh, that work. And the association was a place where we could support uh, those frontline caregivers in a very tangible way. Mm-hmm. And I would say that that why uh, became even more real uh, when I had the good fortune to um, become married and and have children. We Mm -hmm. have now a a 19-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter, uh, both of whom, by the way, have had very significant health care struggles. They were Mm both uh, um, uh, children who spent significant time in neonatal intensive care units uh, shortly after they were born. And if I didn't have the passion for healthcare before that experience, uh, boy, that really did uh, ingrain that uh, even more yeah. fully. And so now I get out of bed every morning determined to be as helpful as I can in this role uh, to the folks who are really uh, changing lives mm-hmm. in a very uh, significant way. Yeah. And uh, that's really my passion. And uh, I, I don't think that will ever change. Well, it's a remarkable why. And, and one of the things that I, when I come back from the MHA meetings, you know, I tell Rachel, man, Brian's got fire in his belly. You know, mm-hmm. the guy is just, uh, and, and how you demonstrate that is really through the leadership team that you surrounded yourself with. And uh, I would say amazing leadership. And when I come back from those board meetings, oftentimes I just have to fire an email off like, geez, just incredible job. You know, as a, as a member sitting there listening to, you know, countless presentations, both uh, what's happening in the political landscape, what's happening in the reimbursement landscape. It's just overwhelming to know that we have such a a resource available to rural hospitals and hospitals in Michigan in general. Mm -hmm. But uh, you put together a pretty aggressive program uh, for this year, and it is intense. And I think your staff uh, obviously are feeling uh, that intense pressure. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there's a moment to lose here in our fight because the reason we started Rural Health Rising was to, you know, highlight and elevate the position of rural hospitals across America and to share with congressional leaders, state leaders, uh, politicians, whoever it is, the critical importance of keeping rural hospitals in their communities. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, a project that we're working on uh, with several people to highlight this on a national mm-hmm. scale, uh, really to talk about the hospital closures. But what I want to focus on right now is your program year. Mm-hmm. So we're probably halfway through now, uh, the program year, and you've had a tremendous amount of projects that you have tasked your team with. Um, so I, I guess what I'm asking for and in, in for our listeners, give us uh, you know a list of those things that you can provide as an update for our program and the agenda, what's happening, you know, what are the top priorities and those things? Well, absolutely. And, and first of all, thanks for your kind words. I think that the magic of our association over the years in terms of our ability to move the needle on public policy and, and even outside of the public policy domain is the fact that, number one, we have an incredible staff. They're extremely talented, extremely intelligent, mm-hmm. and extremely committed uh, to mm-hmm. the work that we do every they day. Are, they are. And number two, uh, I would say the same about our board of trustees and about our membership writ large, meaning we're one of the very few state hospital associations in America that has 100% membership. Every hospital in the state is an active member in good standing. Mm -hmm. Our board of trustees is incredibly committed. Uh, They'll put their competitive differences to the side Mm -hmm. when we come around the MHA board table. Uh, Those hospitals and health systems who may not have a rural footprint, Mm -hmm. they will actually get into the weeds and be incredibly helpful from a political advocacy perspective Mm -hmm. to advance our rural health agenda. That's been the culture of the MHA for many years. And, and, and the opposite is also true as well. Our rural members have supported mm-hmm. uh, advocacy priorities that may not directly benefit them and are more oriented towards our, right. our urban uh, members. And so it's a all-for-one, one-for-all mm-hmm. mentality. Now, to your question about uh, what we've been up to in yeah. this current program year, which ends uh, at our annual meeting the end of June, so we're, we're getting closer to that uh, finish line We actually had a very ambitious strategic action plan Mm -hmm. that our board articulated uh, at the beginning of the year. And it composes four specific items. One is financial viability. The second is workforce well-being and restoration. Uh, The third is behavioral health. And the fourth is health Mm -hmm. equity. Mm -hmm. Starting with the financial viability issue, 
Uh, I think the general public believes that because the the COVID-19 pandemic is largely in the rearview mirror now and that we were able to secure significant relief funding from the federal and, and state level for our membership, that all is well uh, among our Michigan hospitals from a financial perspective. And the reality is nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. Uh, we certainly have continued uh, increased cost in our supply chain, our supplies and equipment, mm -hmm. and even more importantly, explosive cost growth in terms mm -hmm. of our frontline caregivers, yeah. our workforce, uh, starting with nurses, but certainly yeah. not ending there. And so we went to the legislature. Uh, we went to Congress at the federal level, and we said, here's the picture. This is the reality of what our members are dealing with. The good news is that we have already, in this new legislative session, secured another $75 million yeah. in a special appropriation uh, here in Michigan right. directed towards our hospital workforce. The MHA mm -hmm. is the fiduciary of those funds. We are now in the process of... Uh, sending those out to our member mm -hmm. hospitals. This is very similar, as you may recall, to the $300 million appropriation that mm -hmm. we secured last year. Again, yes. that, that was with a different legislature. Right. Right. And then at the same time, and this crosses over into that behavioral health priority, uh, we also signed a contract with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We had, were very successful in securing $60 million in funding for behavioral health. Uh, $50 million of that is dedicated towards pediatric behavioral health. And MHA critical. is the uh, facilitator now yeah. of an RFP process. And right. we'll be able to, to send those funds uh, to our members, mm -hmm. both large and small, urban and rural, um, as we expand our capacity and our, our ability to meet this yeah. vexing challenge of behavioral health, particularly in the pediatric oh, yeah. realm. Clearly. And so we've already made some real tangible progress I would end on the financial viability piece with this comment, which is uh, none of this new quote unquote work, mm -hmm. this new focus takes away at all from our historic focus on the traditional Medicaid budget negotiations, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. always begin when the governor introduces his or her, in this case, her, Governor Whitmer's mm -hmm. uh, executive budget recommendation, which occurred uh, back in late January, early February. And I'm very pleased to say that as we sit here today, all of our MHA priorities are protected. Yeah. Whether that's Medicaid uh, payment rates right. for hospitals right. and physicians, whether that's graduate medical education funding, yeah. and specific to rural health, our rural access pool mm -hmm. and our OB stabilization yes. pools. Huge. Mm -hmm. Those are incredibly important to our rural members throughout yeah. the state. We created those pools a number of years ago and have successfully mm -hmm. protected them uh, every year since. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is a lot on the table yeah. simply within that financial viability bucket. It's pretty amazing to watch the work that you do because, you know, I want to highlight a few things. You've been, so you've been at this uh, since your early days of internship. How many years total has this been for you now? Uh, this is my 33rd year. 33rd year. The MHA, and most of that time uh, has been involved in some way, shape, or form in the political public yeah, policy domain. And that's the point I want to raise because regardless of the leadership, you know, what is remarkable about your association, nonpartisan, because I have watched you uh, attend fundraisers for Republicans, uh, for Democrats. I've watched you work with uh, a Republican-led legislature, a Democratic-controlled, uh, you know, governorship. Uh, and uh, what's amazing is that during each of these uh, leadership transitions, you maintain your position to mm -hmm. assist hospitals like ours. And what's remarkable is you had huge success during COVID in getting us funding, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of dollars right. to Michigan hospitals during a time of, you know, Republican leadership. But contrast that with just now right. finding additional funding for us in, you know, a different controlled environment. So I think what that speaks volumes to is your work. And that I want to ask you, I mean, that's got to be like intense mm -hmm. to deal with all of those political, uh, I'm going to say wranglings that mm -hmm. occurs, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there may be a CEO listening uh, across this country right now wondering what is the value of my local state or my state association for my local hospital belong to them. Uh, I think the value is what we just shared. It's not just the priorities that are set, but it's really that political dynamic that regardless of who's in office, 
I may disagree with them as a small rural hospital. Uh, you're there advocating for us in a nonpartisan way. Do you find that to be one of the most significant challenges? And maybe not. Well, you're you're uh, spot on in terms of your observations. And I would say over time, the MHA has been a uh, very nonpartisan organization. Yeah. That is not true for a number of other associations in Lansing or in mm-hmm. other state yeah. capitals around That's the true. country. But the reality is we've recognized for a long time that health care is the ultimate nonpartisan issue. You're right. Uh, whether you are Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. At some point in time, you or a loved one is going to require health care and, right. and more than likely uh, health care in a hospital setting yeah. at some yeah. point. And so uh, we have really approached it that way. And mm-hmm. when you look at advocacy, there is a saying that's very powerful, which is it's tough to make a friend when you need a friend. And what that really means mm-hmm. is You don't wait until there is a crisis and you need a vote yes or a vote no in the legislative domain to really build a relationship with an elected official. Uh, What you do is build a relationship well in advance and you build those relationships with Republicans, with Democrats, with House members, with Mm -hmm. Senate members, Mm -hmm. with folks on all different committees. And so at the end of the day, uh, hopefully – They understand your issues. Mm -hmm. They understand that you are trustworthy, Mm -hmm. that you're providing them with uh, good information that is reliable and accurate. Uh, That's really what we hang our hat on. You do. Uh, It's those relationships and it's the caliber of the the information and the stories that we're able to convey on behalf of our members. And I think over time, that trustworthiness has really... Uh, elevated the association yeah. in mm-hmm. in the eyes of elected officials. And to your point, JJ, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that over time, there have been priority issues mm-hmm. uh, for the association year in and year out, medical liability oh, reform, yeah. huge, uh, the 340B drug huge. program, mm-hmm. certificate of need. Oh, yes. Um, all of these issues that we have successfully advanced and mm-hmm. protected, whether it is Republican right. or Democrat control. Speaks volumes. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's really important to understand and, and for us to continue into I the agree. future. I right. agree. Let's go a little bit deeper into the financial viability piece, because I do think, at least for us working in healthcare right now, that is one of our biggest focuses and and concerns that's ever present um, today. More, you know, for rural hospitals, we've been used to that for a long time, but it's more industry wide now than it has been, I think, in the past, in my experience, at least. But can you elaborate a little bit on how does that financial viability element impact Michigan patients and the way our hospitals and health systems are even able to deliver the care that we provide. Absolutely. And the reason that all Michiganders should care about this issue is the simple fact that we really want to have a viable health care infrastructure Mm -hmm. that's accessible Mm -hmm. to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of their socioeconomic status, in both urban and rural communities Mm -hmm. throughout the state. The reality Mm -hmm. is we are a mobile society and we move around a lot on the job to visit family and friends, to vacation, you name it. And so having that infrastructure in place, a viable infrastructure, is incredibly important. It's also incredibly important to economic development. Mm -hmm. We know that in rural settings, the hospital is quite often the largest employer if not at least one of the largest yes. employers. And if you think about it, it's very difficult for a business of any sort to attract and retain talent if there's not a yeah. viable hospital Absolutely. and viable healthcare yeah. infrastructure yeah. in that community. And that's a message that we've been lifting up in this right. uh, current MHA program year, collaborating with uh, other business-oriented mm-hmm. associations mm-hmm. and or organizations, certainly with the higher education community. Right. And here's really the financial viability challenge in a nutshell. And I think it's being felt more acutely within our rural membership. Everyone right now across the economy is dealing with rising costs in the supply chain because of inflationary pressures. Everyone, for the most part, is dealing with increased cost of labor. So we're no mm-hmm. different than, than other sectors of the economy as far as that goes. Where the difference comes into play is that most other businesses can more easily pass along those increased Correct. costs of doing business to the end consumer. Right. Whether that's uh, the cost of a gallon of gas at the pump, the cost right. of a gallon of milk in the grocery right. store. Right. 
But in healthcare, we are, to use business uh, yeah. terminology, we are price takers yeah. when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid, which are Absolutely. enormous uh, uh, elements of the healthcare financing uh, ecosystem in That's American right. healthcare. When it comes to private insurance, these uh, reimbursements are largely tied to multi-year contracts that are negotiated well in advance. Mm -hmm. They don't turn on a dime. Right. And once again, very difficult to uh, to pass along those yeah. costs. And so Extremely. what we found is that our hospitals uh, in Michigan and, and in other states are really in a very difficult spot. And it's exactly why we've been uh, advocating yeah. with our elected officials to make it through this very difficult period we need your support. I think right. that was that was an instrumental yeah. message was. that led to lawmakers and the governor supporting that seventy five million dollar appropriation that we, yeah. we mm -hmm. mentioned. I agree, mm -hmm. and it's it's not as if you're operating just in a healthcare silo. I think that's an, an another important uh, topic to discuss is is how do you interact with and how does the Michigan uh, MHA uh, intersect with other industry leaders and industries and you know what's your perspective on that so it's you're not just solely in in that silo you have to span across various industries and you just spoke of one working hand in hand with EDC or working with another sector so could you talk to us a little bit about how that relationship comes together well, exactly correct. And even within healthcare, uh, there are a number of other organizations Tremendous. that represent the health plan community, that represent the nursing yeah. home community, and, and right. so on. And I think those have always been uh, very close partners of mm -hmm. ours, the Michigan Center for Rural Health, of course. But looking outside of healthcare, I think there are a couple of things to lift up. One is uh, we have always relied on the education community to help train our next yeah, generation of point. clinicians and, and healthcare leaders. I think that's true now more than ever, ever because you rewind the clock, even before the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. uh, showed up here in, in Michigan, we knew that we had a real pipeline challenge on our hands by virtue of the fact that the baby boomers over the coming years increasingly were going to be uh, heading off to retirement. And there were certainly not enough younger folks uh, to come in and fill those, mm -hmm. uh, those vacancies. Mm -hmm. Then the pandemic happens and really throws uh, gasoline on that fire mm -hmm. because a lot of folks who thought, well, maybe I'm going to work another two, three, four years right. – well, they're out, they're out yeah. uh, either entirely or maybe they're they're reducing yeah. full time down to part time. You know the story. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so I, I think the the need to work with the education community, and we have been working directly mm -hmm. with the four year universities mm -hmm. as well as the community colleges. One very tangible success story: uh, we got funding in uh, the budget last year, and are now working with our friends in, in the higher education community so that. Uh, for those who want to become nurses, we yeah. need more nurses for mm -hmm. sure. Clearly. Uh, the community colleges now have the opportunity more than ever before yeah. because of this uh, new public policy, they can actually help us to yeah. fill that pipeline. So that's one place. The other thing I would lift up is the fact that now more than ever, we are seeing a sea change in the way we go about the delivery of health care. It used to be that we waited until someone was sick or injured to show up at the hospital right. doorstep. Right. We treat them, we send them on their way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the old model. I mm -hmm. think the new model takes into account the social determinants of health. And this is where we get into the health equity discussion. Mm -hmm. You think about housing, food insecurity, transportation, language barriers. These are all things that contribute to mm -hmm. the health status of an individual yes. and the health status of yep. a community. And if that's true, then it means that we at the association have to work with some non-traditional partners yeah. as well right. to help us uh, address those very uh, yeah. vexing issues. Yeah. And, and Rachel, you may not know this, but uh, when I attend these meetings, we hear all of this work that's being done. And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes you will not hear about it. The, the, the individual in rural health care or in hospitals will not hear about it until maybe even a year after they have you know had the time to dive into this. But one of the areas that the MHA has been successful is identifying talent pipelines for us. Mm -hmm. As you know, right. a lot of our universities and colleges uh, no longer offered SENA programming mm -hmm. and scrub tech. And the MHA took the leadership of having the discussions with higher education and saying, you know what, rural hosp hospitals in general 
You know, right. I talked to my colleagues across the country. Mm-hmm. This is this is not just a Michigan problem. Obviously, right. it was right. uh, certainly highlighted during the pandemic. But the reality of it is, we knew that that pipeline was going to be somewhat strangulated, and now we faced the significant challenge of finding replacements for these positions because the challenge is no one is coming out of these colleges and, right. and these technical centers with these degrees. So right. Brian Peters, his team got together and said, you know what, we have to help these hospitals because mm-hmm. the cost of labor you know, has compounded this significant financial crisis in mm-hmm, hospitals. Mm-hmm. Travelers, Which has been due to the, you know, uh, the supply and demand yes, issue, correct, right? Supply right. is low and so demand is high. That's right. And that's, that's when right. you get things like the cost of that's travelers. Right. That's right. And so when we talk about advocacy at different levels, Brian, I just want to thank you for, you know, your leadership in reaching a- across the spectrum and having the dialogue with the universities and the colleges about technical training programs, pipelines, you know, for these programs. And it's been very instrumental because we are starting to participate in some of those programs now. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, we always are challenged because who wants to come to rule, right? That's often what we hear. Well, who right. wants to come to rule right. healthcare? And then if you do get them to rule healthcare, the question is, do they have the skill set, the training? Mm-hmm. Because we don't have the, you know, the the plethora of training programs in rural hospitals. And Mm -hmm. so we rely on the technical colleges, the universities to train up this workforce. So the great news and the reason that I go on this diatribe is that MHA has worked with us, hospitals like Hillsdale, to ensure that we can identify talent that we can bring back to our local hospitals to the end goal take great care of our patients. Mm -hmm. That's what we're after. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been probably the most instrumental for me is in that recruitment piece is to have the colleges and universities set up. Right, right. And, you know, I serve on the legislative policy panel for MHA. So I see a lot of the, um, you know, legislative proposals and concerns and discussions and issues that MHA is focused on, because as a panel, we look at some of those, some of them, we vote on specific positions for the association to take. But what action can lawmakers take right now to address the rising costs in healthcare and also this major issue we have of staffing shortages? Well, I think there are a number of issues. When you think about uh, financial viability and our workforce challenge, they are so closely interrelated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There are some places where we're playing offense and other places where we're playing defense. So um, to your question about what can our elected officials do, certainly to support funding uh, of the nature that we, we discussed previously, uh, we're going to be back uh, to the legislature yet this, uh, this session yeah. talking about some very specific ways that we believe the state of Michigan can leverage federal matching dollars through the Medicaid program, whether Mm -hmm. that's supporting level one and level two trauma centers, whether Mm -hmm. that's raising Mm -hmm. uh, Medicaid rates for our OB uh, physicians who work in hospitals. Uh, There are a number of other ways that we've identified uh, to do exactly that. And then secondly, when it comes to the workforce, I reflect on one of our real public policy wins a year ago, which was uh, we have a policy everyone should be able to practice at the top of their license. I think that is critically important, particularly for our rural hospitals who for years said, you know what, if we had the ability of CRNAs to administer anesthesia in an independent fashion, much like the rest of the country has done for for quite some time, that would really be be helpful to addressing that portion of our workforce challenge. Long story short, we were successful uh, in passing that legislation. The governor signed it uh, into law. I think that is one element. There will be many others in the years to come in terms of scope of practice. Mm -hmm. I think technology is going to be a force multiplier Mm -hmm. when it comes to our healthcare workforce Mm -hmm. and financial viability challenge. So we will look to lawmakers at the state and federal level Mm -hmm. to support public policy that embraces that technology. For example, in the telehealth domain, in rural Michigan, there are still communities that lack uh, broadband uh, that's yes. critical here in Hillsdale. Critical right. infrastructure yep. to making yeah. telehealth work at its maximum yes. uh, efficiency. Uh, public policy that supports reimbursement for telehealth. Mm-hmm. Remember that mm-hmm. our public health emergency ends on May 11th, it does. Right. and along with that, a number of uh, regulations and policies that we have. Uh, lifted up and benefited right. from during, during the, the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, we're arguing that some of those things 
should continue uh, going forward. We should, for all intents and purposes, be allowed to continue uh, being engaged with the multi-state nurse licensure compact, Mm -hmm. for example. We technically are not, but during the public health emergency, we were given that that opportunity. So again, there are a number of things. When you think about uh, bad public policy, things that we don't want to see happen because it would complicate our lives and dramatically increase cost. And that is something like nurse staffing ratio legislation. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nothing new. We've no. seen these bills introduced Correct. in the past. We've always been able to to have our nurse leaders, our, our CNOs, step yeah. forward and say, here's why a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't Does make work. sense right. because the nurse staffing needs unit by unit at Hillsdale Hospital and other rural settings probably looks a lot different on a Wednesday afternoon yeah. than the staffing in the emergency department at a Detroit hospital Correct. on a Saturday night That's right. might right. look. That's right. Right. And you pay CNOs mm-hmm. to figure out day-to-day um, seasonality, what is the technology that you have at your disposal? Mm-hmm. What's the level of education? What's the acuity level of your patient right. population, et cetera? And make those decisions about staffing. By the way, we now have approximately 27,000 vacancies for frontline caregivers yeah. in our Michigan hospitals. Absolutely. That's based on a very recent survey of our membership. Mm-hmm. Very large portion of those are nurses. The point being... Mm-hmm. If you were to pass this staffing ratio legislation, we would be unable to meet the requirements. We're trying our very best to uh, to hire those nurses right now as we speak, and and we can't do it. That's right. So this is really the uh, the conundrum we find ourselves in. Absolutely. So you obviously have been in healthcare longer than I. I'm not calling you old. Uh, I just entered entered later. I entered later. But, uh, you know, 14 years. In the 14 years that I have been here at Hillsdale, uh, I have never witnessed such uh, financial v- uh, volatile uh, environment that we have been in over the last, I would say, truly the last year. And the reason I say year, you know, some could take it back pre-pandemic, um, but the pandemic gave us, uh, it kind of gave us a, a false sense of where our balance sheets mm-hmm, were mm-hmm. because, you know, we had some advanced payments. That's some cushion. It, it was. And and so there was there was a few hospitals, obviously, that um, struggled to understand that that had to be paid back, uh, you know, across America, and and they've struggled. But we we knew uh, that that was going to be a requirement, so we made uh, appropriate uh, took appropriate action to make sure that that was paid. However, uh, when we consider the financial challenges, Brian, this when when we talk about hospital closures, um, you know, it's not because of generally speaking, ineffective CEOs or CFOs, you know, we're not talking about a bad board of directors. Uh, One of the things that you highlighted was when we are delivering a product, unlike the grocery store or the gas station, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the guy that puts oil in your car, he can shift those costs to the consumer. We can't. Rural health, small hospitals like ours, I have no negotiating power with Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is what they tell us they give us. This is what we take. Without increases from Medicaid, the cost of doing business in rural hospitals, 72%, Brian, of my payer mix is either the federal or state government, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, That looks much different in urban areas, obviously. Um, It looks much different in areas that has, you know, a strong workforce and and economic uh, development. Uh, But in rural communities uh, like ours, uh, the challenge is uh, financially, how do you keep your hospitals viable? And you do that through growth. Uh, You can't grow your way out of the situation. You know, we have to count on payers and we have to look at ways of payment reform that we have been working on here for about the last three years. Um, But all of that to say, During some of the most critical times, the MHA did step up and help hospitals fill a gap and sustain their finances to make it through. Now, to make it through to what? No one knows yet. I mean, we will, I I assume we'll look back in three years and history will judge how we handled those years. But truly, as we look at it, um, the MHA has been involved in the last six months of, all right, the the relief funding has expired. Uh, we've got to work with the legislature to find new money. The state government brought in, I think, $6 billion maybe. Was it with a $6 billion? I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Um, and everybody across every county had their hands out. 
You know, mm-hmm. every every group that wanted to prioritize something had their hands out. Uh, you uh, representing hospitals also, you know, came to the table and uh, made compelling cases. But I, if you could reflect the last, let's just say the last four to six months, uh, the work that you've done, not taking into account the relief dollars, um, what things have you done to advocate for additional funding for these reliefs of hospitals? Right. It's a lot to unpack. Uh, I will tell you that um, we are proud uh, of our voice uh, when we come to the state legislature, when we come to Congress, when we talk with the media. I think we have an incredibly uh, viable story to tell about the plight of our member hospitals throughout the state of Michigan. Um, Not to say that other sectors of the economy aren't struggling as well. They Mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think we all understand intuitively uh, just how important it is Mm -hmm. to maintain a viable hospital and health system infrastructure here in the state of Michigan. We've talked about the economic impact that that has. We've talked about, you know, the access to care for everyone in the community. So we know how critically important that is. When you talk about the the funds that the state uh, currently has at their disposal, uh, many of those funds have to be appropriated by the end of 2024 Mm -hmm. and then spent at a a particular time frame Mm -hmm. after that. So uh, the the legislature and the administration still has a little bit of time before they uh, resolve how they're going to uh, deploy those funds. This is, uh, by the way, very similar to uh, the situation in other states as well, because Mm -hmm. we're talking about federal funds right, that, right. that came forward during the uh, the days of the pandemic. But we are really doing something that our MHA Board of Trustees has called telling our story. And it's using every opportunity we possibly can to paint the picture. Here's mm-hmm. the reality of the, the current situation facing our hospitals. Mm-hmm. And to do that not only as hospitals and health system voices, but to bring in those other important players in our communities who also have a stake in this outcome as well. Mm -hmm. So we've hosted a series of regional roundtables that have included uh, business organizations and representatives of the higher education community, certainly Mm -hmm. other partners within the healthcare space. And I think we've had very good response. I think there's a a growing drumbeat that says... um, we really do need to step Mm -hmm. forward and create good public policy that helps uh, Michigan hospitals. I think you pointed to something that's critically uh, important. If I reflect all the way back to my internship days at the MHA a long time ago, um, the percentage of Michiganders who were covered by those public programs you mentioned, Medicaid and Medicare, was very, very small. In other words, the impact that it had on the financial viability Mm -hmm. of rural or urban hospitals was much, much smaller then. It was important for Mm -hmm. sure, Mm -hmm. but much smaller then. We've seen dramatic growth in Medicare organically because the population is aging, Mm -hmm. and that's going to continue. We've seen dramatic growth in Medicaid, both because of economic circumstances in the state, but also because we expanded Medicaid, the Healthy Michigan Plan. Thankfully, we did that because Mm -hmm. we're talking about folks who otherwise would be completely uninsured today Mm -hmm. with all that that entails. And hospitals that would have closed, I would. Without a doubt. Absolutely. There have been many studies, in fact, that uh, point to the fact that those states that did not initially uh, expand Medicaid, the impact on their rural hospitals was felt very dramatically. In other words, we we were very fortunate that we were able to get that uh, across the finish line. Uh, But the reality is, uh, again, to your point, more and more Michiganders who are covered by those public programs, which means advocacy is not a spectator sport. We all need to... Uh, engage in the process, tell our elected officials that, look, it's important that Medicaid and Medicare at the federal level pay their fair share Mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, we can continue a viable infrastructure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Agree. Mm -hmm. So how can our listeners, people who are hearing this podcast right now, whether they're a hospital executive, a patient, or, you know, a resident, get involved and advocate for the hospitals and healthcare workers in their own community? Well, I'm glad you asked because this is really our bread and butter at the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Uh, We have a website, 
mha.org. Mm-hmm. Uh, within that website, you'll find the My Care Champion uh, page. Uh, this is an opportunity for any member of the Michigan public to engage in the process. In fact, you can easily identify here are your elected officials, contact information for your state representative, right. your mm-hmm. state senator, yep. your member of Congress, Critical. your United States senators. And, and this is how you can actually reach out to them and share your perspective, right. why you believe it's important for mm-hmm. you, your family, mm-hmm. your business, mm-hmm. that we have good public policy right. to support hospitals and healthcare. And certainly within our, our website, uh, we have a host of information, talking points, data, the facts uh, that uh, you can bring to bear. Uh, but really, as I say, politics is not a spectator sport. Right. That means uh, if all you're doing is reading the news Mm -hmm. and complaining about the decisions that are being made, Mm -hmm. um, that's not moving the needle. Uh, But lawmakers, we have found, and both political parties, uh, are very willing to listen to their constituents. Mm -hmm. They really are. They're willing to come to your place of business, including hospitals, Mm -hmm. I I might add, and talk with the people firsthand, tour the facilities, and understand what the issues are. And mm-hmm. so we work directly with our members in that regard. But quite frankly, any member of the Michigan public that's interested in good health care, mm-hmm. you can join this fight. Yeah, and absolutely. we would encourage you to do so. Absolutely. Well, believe it or not, our time is coming to a close here. But there is one question uh, that I want to ask, Brian. So About every three months, uh, my predecessor will text me, uh, Duke Anderson, and you know Duke, he was on the board as well, and he'll say, what's keeping you up at night? And (laughs) I used to rattle off, you know, two or three things, "Ah, I'm worried about about this, Duke. Uh, He texted me the other day. He's uh, in uh, Florida at the spring training for the Tigers, loving life, and uh, sends me a picture. (laughs) And uh, I'm not too happy about that. But then he says, what's keeping you up at night? And I Mm -hmm. said, Duke, comma, what's not keeping me up? at night in healthcare. It's everything. (laughs) Right. Right. So my question to you is, as the leader of the MHA, uh, you have have handled a tremendous amount of public crisis. You've handled hospital closures. uh, You've handled, you know, politics. Brian Peters, what keeps you up at night when you think about all of those things in totality for how to save healthcare? My answer to that question today is precisely the same uh, answer that I gave to our board of trustees back when I was first hired uh, mm-hmm. in this role uh, eight years ago uh, to be the CEO, and that answer is member unity. True. Mm. I could list any number of public policy issues and yeah, challenges that are, are vexing the field. Some we've talked about yeah. uh, today, others we, we haven't had a, a chance to address. Uh, but the reality is I am confident that if we have member unity, meaning mm-hmm all of our rural hospitals, all of our big health systems Mm -hmm. stay together in the tent and pull for each other Mm -hmm. in the public policy domain, pull for each other when it comes to safety and quality improvement, Mm -hmm. which is something we're we're very much uh, engaged with, uh, then we will have the outcomes that we are looking for. If Mm -hmm. we separate, uh, if we don't present a united front, uh, bad things happen. You're right. And we've seen that in other states. Uh, I don't ever want to uh, to replicate that no. here in Michigan. Mm-hmm. And so, again, my answer and my focus, my priority, as long as I'm in this role, mm-hmm. first and foremost is going to be member unity. Well, and you've done a remarkable job at that. I just want to tell you from my perspective, okay? So when you called me and asked me to be part of the – consider being part of the MHA board, you know, I had, I had shared with Duke when he said, you know, what, what are your ambitions – uh, what boards do you want to serve on? I said, you know, if I can make it to the Blue Cross Blue Shield board and the MHA board, life would be good. <laughs> and then I got the call from Brian uh, not too long into my presidency asking if I'd be interested in, mm-hmm. in representing rural hospitals. Of course, I, I, I accepted that. But on the drive to Mackinac with my wife, uh, I said, well, honey, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> you know, I don't know if they're going to have a little kitty table for the rural hospitals. I, I didn't know. I didn't know if we were going to have our separate hotels or what the, what the deal was. But to the point, you know, you've done a remarkable job at bringing all of us together. And I have been on a different side arguing against mergers and acquisitions very strongly. I spoke at Beckers about this and fierce advocate against it. But we have some in the membership who are 
firm believers that that's the only answer to saving uh, hospitals. Um, and I just want to tell you that you've done a remarkable job um, as, I'll say, the referee. Uh, but <laughs> but truly, there is, when we come together, I don't even sense that, honestly, uh, having dinner with a system of, you know, 100,000 employees to, you know, my 700. Uh, I don't feel the division. Uh, and I was really worried about that. And, and I want to encourage our listeners, uh, if you are in a state – uh, and, and you are not participating in your state association, I want to encourage you, the things that Brian Peter spoke about today are the reasons why you should engage your state association. Mm-hmm. The fact that we have 100% participation is, it, it's a testimony to you. Okay, I want to say that. So do we have to take Thank some time you. to talk about Brian Peters for a minute? Yes. Because the work that you have done, and, and this is this is me as a member hospital, not as a member of your board, but as a member hospital, saying the work that you have done has saved many rural hospitals in Michigan. Without your advocacy in getting the funds into us, I don't know where we would be, honestly. And I often reflect upon that. And I just want you to know the work that you're doing is tremendous. It is overwhelming. Uh, but it is really guarded um, in our hearts as a, we are in full appreciation of the work that you have done for hospitals like mine. Now, uh, I say rule. You know, I know you're also doing this work for large systems, uh, and you're flying across uh, the state. You were, you know, up just a few months ago in the uppermost part of Michigan, and you've been uh, at different hospital board meetings presenting. It's a crazy schedule for you, but you're doing it to advance uh, healthcare, and also with the perspective of making sure that our patients and our communities have the resources necessary. It's saving lives, Brian. I mean, when you think about the work that you're doing, it is truly saving lives because if our hospital didn't exist, the nearest hospital, you know, 40 minutes away, uh, what would happen to a patient who, number one, doesn't have transportation? We have, we have no public transportation in this community other than the city. It's very limited. No countywide transportation. Patients who can't even get a ride to a hospital. They're riding with the Amish. Okay, mm-hmm. true story. How are they going to get to a hospital uh, if it's 45 minutes away? So that type of work saves lives each and every day. And we're going to talk at lunch with a couple of my senior uh, leaders about another problem, EMS coverage, and that's a whole other topic that we'll talk about in the future, uh, and and then the workforce. And, and But in each of those areas, you've been extremely vital in getting the message out about why we have to sustain rural health and healthcare in general. So on behalf of Hillsdale Hospital, as a member of the Board of Trustees for the MHA, mm-hmm. thank you for your contributions, advocacy. And, and I'll tell you, this guy doesn't take vacations, okay? Um, <laughs> I don't know, you know, if your kids just loathe you because you don't do that. You must do something nice for them. But uh, the you guy- the pot calling the cut I, black I understand that. One, that. I understand. But my kids <laughs> loathe me, all right? I'm okay with that. They understand. But truly, the work that you're doing just is day and night. You know, you and I are texting each other at night and sending emails at 11 o'clock. Uh, so thank you for your advocacy and the work that you do, Brian. We truly appreciate you. Well, thank you so much, JJ. You're too kind. Uh, Again, as I said before, I'm blessed to have this job, and our success is really based on the amazing team that we have at MHA of dedicated professionals and and our amazing board, our amazing membership. Uh, I'm just incredibly honored and and privileged to have this role and have an opportunity to to do my part. Uh, But you're exactly right. I think this work absolutely is saving lives. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm just so proud of, mm-hmm. of the MHA family. And that's really what it is. True. Our, our staff, our members, our business partners, we use that term MHA family and it's real. It is real. It, it is real. And uh, the, the relationships that have established uh, themselves over the years, even between our members and their, their spouses and their children. I mean, I've seen that over time yeah. and it's created these bonds so mm-hmm. that when we get in a room and we have these tough conversations about big, weighty issues, yeah. uh, we're doing so as trusted friends, yeah. not just mm-hmm. business people across the table Absolutely. from each other. Absolutely. And I think that is a, a very fundamental um, difference. And it's a dynamic that that's uh, something I'm committed to continuing right. into the future. Well, thank you again for joining us today on Rural Health Rising. It's been great to have you here. Thank you, JJ. Thank you, Rachel. Next time on Rural Health Rising, we'll have another great conversation with another great guest. So be sure to tune in.
And with that, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tell others why they should listen too. Your feedback helps more listeners find Rural Health Rising. And you can now find us on Twitter. I'm at Hillsdale CEO JJ. Rachel is at Rural Health Rach. And you can also follow the podcast at Rural Health Pod. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay strong. Rural Health Rising is a production of Hillsdale Hospital in Hillsdale, Michigan, and a proud member of the Health Podcast Network. Hosted by J.J. Hodshire and Rachel Lott. Audio engineering and original music by Kenji Ulmer. Special thanks to today's guest, Brian Peters, CEO of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. For more episodes, interviews, and more information, visit ruralhealthrising.com. 